Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Amherst Williams. I'm the executive director of the Connecticut League of History Organizations. I want to extend a special welcome to you all today um, for our sort of second annual info session on the Museum Makeover Program. This is one of our um, most exciting new initiatives. Um, so I'm really excited to have everyone with us today uh, to learn a little bit more, both about the program and also a little bit about um, what we did in year one. So you'll be, have a chance to see um, some pictures of some of the completed projects from our first round of museum makeover grants. Um, museum Makeover is made possible um, through a collaboration between us and Conservation Connection with funding provided by the state legislature and Connecticut Humanities and Connecticut Department of Economic and Community Development Office of the Arts. So um, we're just really pleased about this program. I want to, before we begin I, and introduce everyone, I just wanted to say a couple of things about this program. I said this is a new service that um, we've been offering in collaboration with Conservation Connection. Um, and we uh, had funding for this program for two years. So we're moving into year two. Um, if you are interested in this program, I really want to encourage you to put in an application this year. Um, it's something we really feel very good about and are going to seek further funding for for future years to continue the program. But at present, we cannot guarantee that we'll be this will, program will be funded beyond um, the, the sort of 2023 instantiations. So um, we can talk a little bit more about that uh, in the Q&A if you want, but um, I don't really know how much more I can share at this point, um, other than to say that we're very excited about this program. We're gonna do everything we can to keep it around, but we can't promise you it'll be there after this year. So um, without further ado, I'm going to introduce Kathy Cargwell Vardo, who's probably well known to all of you. Um, she is the Director of Conservation Connection, which is a program of the Connecticut State Library. Um, she also works as an independent museum consultant in Connecticut and elsewhere. Um, so you may have worked with her out in the field uh, through the Traveling Archivist Program, through Museum Makeover. Um, you may be about to meet her through a, con a collections assessment grant, um, which is another project that she's been working on. But today she's going to be talking about Museum Makeover and um, how things went in year one and how to get involved for the second year. Kathy, go ahead and take it away. Thank you so much, Amherst. Good afternoon, everybody. So great to see so many people here today. Really excited to be able to uh, talk to you once again about Museum Makeover. Year one is in the bag and we have some really terrific outcomes and I'm excited to share with you. And I think that's gonna make it even easier for all of you to kind of think about what projects to apply for because this really, um, I'm hoping you'll be inspired by these projects, see what the outcomes look like and um, be able to really hone in on something that will benefit your site and most importantly, your visitors. So as Amherst mentioned, we are really fortunate to have this funding from the General Assembly. And this is a project with funding from Connecticut Humanities, the uh, Connecticut Office of the Arts, and a partnership between Conservation Connection, which is me, and the Connecticut League, which you all know is Amherst. So let's get into things. You are sharing screen. Is it not going forward? There we go. Okay. So to give you a little bit of an overview of this program. So the point of Museum Makeover is to visibly improve the visitor experience at Connecticut museums and cultural heritage organizations that serve the public. So we want you to pick a program. Now it could be ex exhibitions or it can be collection storage. The reason for st the re that storage is in there is that if you cannot access your collection safely, um, that you don't know what's in your collection storage rooms, you can get those materials out so that they're accessible uh, to your visitors through exhibitions and education. This program brings you professional curators in Connecticut to offer their expertise, consultation, to share concrete ideas and real financial and hands-on assistance so you can immediately make these improvements at, the, at your organization. This is not about three years from now, we're gonna open something. You're gonna have something opened and ready by October 1st of 2023. We wanna also be able to spark conversations and help you forge relationships with professionals in the state, whether they're curators, exhibit designers, graphic designers, fabricators, so that we can help you improve the work that you do, um, and know how to do that work more effectively. 
And by doing all of this, the goal is to broaden and grow your audience. And this will then in turn demonstrate the importance of Connecticut's cultural sector and the amazing things all of you are doing with this investment from the state of Connecticut. So how does this work? Well, this is a competitive grant process. Your application will be reviewed by um, grant evaluators. We will be awarding grants to between 12 to 15 organizations that apply this year. And you can focus on three areas that really directly impact uh, the public experience. So this can be permanent exhibitions at your institution. It can be historic house interpretation, which for example, would mean revamping the interpretation of a parlor or one of your period rooms and collection storage. It can be museum collections or archive collections. You, if you are a successful applicant, you receive between two and three site visits from a team of traveling curators. Um, you talk to them by phone, via Zoom, through emails. It's an ongoing period of communication from the time the grant begins in March of next year through its completion at the um, October 1st. And to make this work happen, you receive up to $3,000 for implementation funding. So that can be used to pay for asset-free boxes, for shelving, if you're doing a storage project. It can be used to hire a graphic designer to have graphic panels produced for your exhibitions. We're very, it's very broad what we will fund. You just have to talk to me about it and we will go through that with you. Applications are due January 5th, 2023. This year, we are using the Connecticut Humanities Grant Portal. So if you've ever applied to Connecticut Humanities before, it'll be a really straightforward and simple process. It's a rather short, to the point grant application. So it's not cumbersome to fill out. Participants will be selected and notified, notified by the end of February of next year. Your site visits can start as early as March, but all the work has to be done by October 1st, 2023. This is not a grant that we can provide extensions for. So what did we fund this year? So we did a, mostly exhibitions. We did a couple storage projects, but I wanna go through them to kind of demonstrate the range of projects that were completed in year one of Museum Makeover. So what you see here is an exhibit of the granary at the Dudley Farm Museum in Guilford, Connecticut. The, where you're looking into this room through the double doors. This is a back room of the barn that was basically just used for storage. But what makes it interesting that you can see on the image on the right is that it had the original bins and shoots of the granary. For most, Amer most modern viewers and visitors, they don't know what that is. So what happened in this project is the granary was cleaned out of anything that was not related to the space. Um, they had done research already. So those became in, um, incorporated in the panels you see on the interior of the doors for when the site is open, they can just open these doors and people can look in. Uh, this is not a space that they walk into, they kind of view it from the ground. But you can see the images of farming. You can see the panels that kind of explain what they're looking at. And it really demonstrates now how this part of the farm was used. So it's a terrific use and they're very happy and have been getting great feedback on the outcome. We also did a project at the Simsbury Historical Society. They have a building and an exhibit that uh, focuses on the Ensign Bigford Company. Ensign Bickford has been in Simsbury for almost 200 years and is really an important part of the development of that community. But the exhibit, and you can see the upper photos are the before images. There was minimal label copy. There were no text panels that really described what you were looking at. There were photographs, but without identification. So in this case, the traveling curators worked with Barbara, who you see in the green sweater in the photo on the upper right, to really make it more engaging when visitors come in. So in the upper photo on the left, you're looking down what is part of the original factory line. But now in the lower picture, there is this super graphic that shows women who worked at the factory in World War I 
now dominating the wall and featuring the title of the exhibit. There are also these three text panels that each focus on a different part of the Ensign Bickford story and how this company ties into the men and women who work there and the Simsbury community. This was a terrific way of taking resources and information they already had and making it more accessible to visitors when they come into this exhibit space. And it makes the exhibit not reliant on docents to convey all the information. Now, one of the things that we found in the first year, and I'm sure this won't come as an, a surprise to anyone, is the number of exhibits out there in Connecticut that have no signage whatsoever. So if you've ever been to the Slater Museum, you have probably seen the image on the left, which is their magnificent uh, exhibit of plaster casts, most of them done in the late 19th century, of famous sculptures from antiquity, ancient Greece, Rome, Egypt. But there was no signage whatsoever explaining what these pieces are and what their significance is. Now, the Slater Museum is part of the campus of the Norwich Free Academy, a high school out in Norwich. So what we did is a test grouping of six labels, which is what you see here, the Venus de Milo, bullet pointing important things to know about why it's in the collection, what is the significance of this piece, where it was found, but then tying it to more modern concepts interpretation. So you see Venus de Milo, the sculpture itself missing her arms, but can be considered an ancient ideal of beauty compared to a modern and contemporary fashion model who's a double amputee. And it gives a way of tying these ancient stories and these ancient artworks to 21st century teenagers and helping them relate to these works. Now, for some of you, and I think many of our museums deal with this issue, if you're not open a lot to the public, how do you make your site engaging and available if visitors happen to show up while you're closed? So the Avery Cop House is on a really great walkable street in Groton. And their idea was to create these outdoor exhibit panels that both tell you about the Avery Cop House, but also about the features that people walking down Thane Street will encounter and may not know what they are. So this is the beginning. This is the iron fence that just goes along the front of the house. And you can see how these graphic panels all weather, weather resistant, color safe, are there now to engage visitors as they're um, coming to the house. And it's a great way of introducing them to your story and then hoping that they'll come back to visit you when you're open. Now, I did mention we did about four collection storage projects. You see two of them here, the Wilton Historical Society and the Historical Society of Glastonbury. Um, in both these cases, what we were working on was helping them upgrade their storage to expand capacity. So at Wilton, you can see the track. Um, we literally tripled the amount of storage they had by um, funding and paying for this movable track of metal shelving that can slide back and forth. So it's a less expensive version of compact shelving. Um, the historic site of Glastonbury was able to move into some new spaces and create some new storage rooms. So you can see how that was used for both shelving and for acid-free boxes. Um, the goal here with collection storage is the better organized and the more accessible your storage room is, the better, the more likely it will be that you'll be able to find items that you wanna incorporate in your exhibitions. And I could tell you at Wilton Historical Society, they actually found a sign that identifies the piece of the George III statue that was destroyed in New York City during the Revolutionary War that they're now planning for their America 250 exhibit because it was located while all the collections were removed from the storage room in order to install the shelving. So how do you go about applying? Oh, and before we get to applying, I'm sorry, I don't have a photograph of this. One other area that you can apply to for this program is historic interpretation. And we're being very specific there. We're talking about a period room. If you have a parlor, a bedroom, uh, a store, 
you have a space that was interpreted quite a while ago, you find that it doesn't convey any specific stories, you can apply to have the curators come out and help you arrange and set and interpret that room with your furnishings to tell a very specific story, okay? So that is available as part of this grant. We didn't have a project for that last year, but we're really hopeful we'll get some of those this year. So for the application, there is the link. If you go to the Conservation Connection website, which is ctconservationconnection.org and go to the Museum Makeover tab, you will be able to see more images of projects that were completed in the first year of Museum Makeover. You will have a link to the grant guidelines. Please, please, please read those through so you're more aware of what is and is not available from this program. There will be the link that will take you to the Connecticut Humanities Portal to complete the application. Um, and you can also see the list of the 15 museums and historical societies that received funding in the first year of the project and see the scope of the projects that were done. Now, some tips, call me. <laughs> I don't get to decide whose projects get funded. So call me, let's talk about your grant. I wanna help you create the strongest application you can. And I have lots of helpful hints and I can help you narrow the focus. It's really important that your project have a tight focus. If you have five storage rooms, we can't do five storage rooms. If you have one really, really overcrowded storage room, we can probably only do one wall or one collection or one section. You really only have three days tops with your traveling curators. So what we want to do is get you from start to finish, showing you how to do a project, giving you the templates and the tools to keep going with it once our part of the project is completed. Same thing with an exhibition. If you have an enormous exhibition room or an exhibit that goes through several rooms, as you saw with Simsbury, there are not text panels throughout that gallery. They're all around a L-shaped temporary wall, okay? So we can help add to something. We can help definitely improve the visitor experience. We can make the information more accessible, but we don't have the capacity to do a whole exhibit or a large room um, and that's why it's really great to uh, important that we speak about this before you do your application. Um, think about how and why having access to our professional curators will impact your project. Have you never done an exhibit before? And so you really need guidance on how to write an exhibition panel. Um, do you not know how to box a historic costume properly? These are the kind of, these are just two examples of what you can say about why it's necessary to have these curators come in and work with you and what you're hoping to learn from them. One thing that's really important is do not apply for a project that's like pie in the sky, something you've been wanting to do, but you haven't actually done any work on. These projects really should be shovel ready. Okay, that means if you want to write label copy and text panels for your exhibition, you need to have already done the research and you need to know what objects you want to add. If you're doing collection storage, uh, you can't tell us, I want to make an archive out of a room that's currently a bedroom. Okay, you know, we need workable space that we can really hit the ground running. Okay, be specific about the outcome you anticipate? That is one of the questions. We want to know how you're going to evaluate the outcome. What, how do you measure success? Success doesn't have, you know, if you're doing a, a, a storage project, don't tell me visitors will see the storage room because that's probably really unlikely. But success could be that your volunteers or your staff are going to learn skills that they don't currently have and that they're gonna be able to continue rehousing and organizing the storage rooms after the muse um, museum makeover project ends and the traveling curators go back to their home sites. And please, please, please submit 
good photographs. It makes a world of difference. And I can tell you in the first year at the grant meeting, applications that did not include photos had a less likely chance of getting funded because the reviewers were left to try to imagine how bad the storage rooms were. What were the exhibits like at this stage before the curators were going to be able to come out and assist you? So by all means, please, please submit those photographs. All right. So as a reminder, January 5th, 2023, 11.59 p.m., as with all Connecticut Humanities grants, that's when they close. That's the deadline. If you get your application in two weeks before the deadline, I am going to work really, really hard to go through and read all of them and add comments, or I will email you about my feedback. Um, but please don't wait to right before Christmas to put those applications in and expect feedback because there's a lot already coming in and I want to be able to help all of you. There is the link to the website. I encourage you all to email me at my email that you see listed there. Email me after today's meeting. We'll set up a time to talk during this coming week. Um, you're my priority right now. You guys get scheduling time first before any other meetings or anything else because I want to give you all plenty of time to discuss your projects. And as Amber said, this is the last year where we have funding in hand. We are really hopeful that we will be able to um, make a good sell with Connecticut Humanities to the General Assembly, that this is an important project that's being that's impactful and really benefiting cultural heritage organizations and their audiences. Um, but we need you to make sure that they know that, and we need to see you applying to have access to this funding. Um, if you think, oh, only 12 to 15 are getting funded, I shouldn't apply. Believe me, there were people last year who said, I, I'm, I'm being funded? Oh my gosh. You never know which projects are going to be the ones selected. Put your application in. Even if you don't get funded this year, I always tell you exactly why you were turned down so that if we get funding next year, you know how to improve those applications. Um, and I can tell you already, we have people applying from last year and I can see that they're using the recommendations that I and the grant panel made to them about how to have a stronger application. So get those applications in, Let, let's have a chance to talk about these projects. And let's show the General Assembly and everybody else that you guys want this support and you really want to take advantage of this funding. So that's my dog and pony show, as my parents would say from the Midwest. And uh, I will open things up back to Amaris and uh, stop sharing and see if we have any questions so far. Great. Thanks, Kathy. Um, so, um, one question has come in, if you have received a collections assessment grant, can you still apply? Absolutely. You, um, having a collections assessment grant does <coughs> not prevent you from also applying for a museum makeover grant. So, and, um, I probably did not mention it, but there is no match for museum makeover. I will say there's one caveat to that. Some institutions selected to add their own funding to the implementation because as long as they were having things printed, they decided to have some additional text panels done or images printed. That's up to you. It's not required for this grant, but there is no match. But you absolutely, if you applied and received a collections assessment grant, you can also apply to Museum Makeover. Yeah, I don't think there are any other funding exclusions, are there, Kathy, that people need to be aware of? You know, you can hold other Connecticut Humanities grants. Right. Um, the only exclusion is if you received funding last year, yeah. you cannot <laughs> come in this year. So you get one dip in the barrel of, of museum makeover money at a right. time. So yes. that is a good one to mention. <laughs> <laughs> 
I haven't opened up the chat. Okay. Any other questions out there? You can pop something in the chat. Um, you can raise your hand or use the um, reactions to raise your hand. I can't see everyone on the screen because we have about 60 people here, but um, now's the okay. time. EC. Okay, so Tom said you applied for an EC CHAP last year, but don't remember getting any feedback is why we weren't selected. Uh, I don't, I'm not remembering what EC CHAP stands for. Are you Amaris? Uh, can I get Mike May at Connecticut Humanities. I think that's one of the. Uh, can may, may I speak? Yeah, yeah. go ahead. <laughs> this is Tom. Hi, Tom. Uh, hi. Uh, and thank you again for this information. Very valuable. Um, EC CHAP uh, is the Eastern Connecticut Center for History, Art, and Performance. Oh, your organization, you said. Oh, I thought that was a grant line. Um, your decline letter should have said why it may, it could have been insufficient funds because honestly some we have very good applications but not enough funding but i actually do remember what your decline was so if you want to email me afterwards i'll share that with you thank you kathy i'll do that sure um and Anne has asked about submitting a video so i don't actually know and i don't know if mike Mises at the humanities knows the answer. I'm not sure if our link will allow a video upload. I would um, lean towards photographs because that they can kind of focus in on each image um, with your application. Um, rather, you than could include. And I would imagine that you could, if you have that video posted somewhere, even just privately, you can include a link to the video. I don't yes. know if you'd be able to upload the video to the app, to the portal itself, um, but if you ha made it available somewhere with the link, I don't see any reason why you wouldn't be able to share that with the grant committee. Is that right, Kathy? Yes. Yeah. There's definitely in your narrative and other places, you can certainly um, include a link to whether it's YouTube or yeah. Flickr or someplace else that you have some images, but do definitely in uh, upload some stills. So Linda is asking if you can apply to Museum Makeover for the same thing that you applied for the assessment grant. So the collection assessment grant, you selected either working, uh, having an assessment done of your museum collection or your archive collection. For Museum Makeover, it has to be even more specific. So it wouldn't be all museum collection storage unless it was all one room um and the same thing for archive storage so let's talk about that but we do want to hone in on something more specific than what you um probably laid out in your collection assessment grant application i would think that they could complement each other or be Absolutely. portions of the the same sort of larger project that you would want to do at your institution linda um, but, you know, again, you're going to want to call and talk with Kathy a little bit more anyway, so I'd suggest you do that. If there's anything any that you want to share here live, you're welcome to. Yeah, and by all means, you know, feel free to, you know, if there's a project you're thinking of or several you're thinking of, we can even talk about those here. Um, the Merrill House is a National Historic Landmark, but not a museum, strictly speaking. Can we apply? Of course. Yes. That's just the name of the program. It's just a catchy title. I don't think we have things. Uh, yeah, I, I, we have, have you... historical societies, libraries yeah. with, our, with collections can apply. So yes, um, we just got catchy and, and was going for some alliteration. Well, you're kind of, I mean, uh, James Merrill House has, is like histor a historic space too. And I you've mean, been it's creating kind of an exhibit property. if I remember, right? On the first floor, you've been creating an exhibit if I... Yeah, you have so, a visitor center that um, yep. you're trying to do some stuff with, so. Yep, so yep. absolutely. Did anybody have any questions about some of the projects that I showed and highlighted um, during the presentation? All of these are open for you to go and see. Um, not all of them have closed for winter yet. I think uh, that is that is something that happens in New England museums. Um, but most of them are having open houses. I will also mention one that I didn't include 
and you can actually go see it on December 18th at two o'clock. The Stanley Whitman House um, is looking at ways of including information about indigenous people and freed and enslaved African-Americans in their historic house tour. So what we actually did there is there's a room before you enter the historic house. And that room has now been interpreted. It's really one of the biggest museum makeovers we've done where it gauges, it's interactive. So on the way into the house, it's asking you a series of questions and asking you to leave your feedback so your docent can see what topics are of interest to you, kind of helps place you where you were, would be standing in 17th century Farmington. And then as you finish the tour, it asks you to kind of share what, what are the things that were memorable to you about your house tour? What are you going to share with other people? Um, everyone that's talked about in the house tour came from someplace else, except for the indigenous people. So they also try to collect where are you coming from and how does the story impact you and your view of New England history, Connecticut history, Farmington history. So if there's a way you want to be very interactive in how you're collecting information from your visitors and how you're gauging their experience, that is something that we did this year. And you can actually go and check it out on December 18th. They're having a tea at the Stanley Whitman House. And um, you can check out, these are all magnetic panels. They're using magnets to collect the information information from visitors. So we've been coming up with some pretty clever and different solutions for this project. So from Bob, would this console include the possibility of increasing a museum storage exhibit areas such as basement or attic space renovation? Well, renovation is the word that sticks out to me. So with $3,000, there's not enough money there to renovate a space. Um, as a museum curator, and someone who works with archives and museum collections, we kind of shy away from basement or attic spaces, but you and I should probably talk about that. But if you have existing storage space, one of the things that we are um, very good at, we have a really great team of people who know how to redesign existing storage rooms to really amp up the available storage space. And um, as you saw with the Wilton, that replaced just freestanding shelves that lined the perimeter of the room and were completely static. And now they have compacting mobile storage, but not the big heavy duty compact storage and easily the collection um, storage in that one area along one wall has tripled. So there's lots of solutions we have out there that we can share with you. Please provide a link to the Stanley House on December 18th. Oh, thank you. I've got it. It's in person, Louise. I popped a link to the registration if you want to check it out. It's on the Stanley Witten website and also Eventbrite. Oh, and Laurie Ann, that you got to see it. Andy is the director there and he walked you through it and you find it really engaging. Fabulous, fabulous. So glad to hear that. And they're really, there's a fabulous exhibit at the Sharon Historical Society now about Charcoal Annie, a French immigrant woman who uh, started her own charcoal making business to support the iron industry up there. We showed you Simsbury, we showed you Slater, Dudley, Trumbull Historical Society has now added information. Uh, if you're not aware, there's actually a, a, a Native American reservation in Trumbull. So they actually met with members of the local tribe to create their text panels about the indigenous story as well as uh, freed African-Americans in the community since the 18th century. Um, I know I'm forgetting projects, but there have been some really um, great work all over the state. Yeah. Kathy, I wonder if, you know, I, I wanna keep things open for questions as well, but I wonder because you've had a chance to see all of the projects sort of from start to finish and come together, are there some things that you would draw out for potential applicants as some of the benefits of participating in a program like this? Like what were the organizations getting out of it in addition to, um, you know, a, a sort of refreshed exhibit or a reorganized collection storage area? What else came out of the program for them? Well, you know, one of the things that people were saying repeatedly, particularly as we got to the end of the projects, 
Uh, a number of the museum directors and volunteers that we worked with were not people who were professionally trained as curators in the museum field. So how to write an exhibit panel, how long an exhibit panel should be, what kind of research you do. Um, you know, for many of them, they said, just being able to sit down and say, okay, an introduction wall panel, no more than a hundred words, which in and itself was a shock to people like, because you're not writing a book, you're writing something to engage your visitor. And the curators have, I can, you know, so much experience having worked on so many exhibitions that they know how to kind of sit down and break out, you know, here's your introduction. And then here's the themes of the exhibit. So talk about what would be the themes and then how to break out that story. And then how do you illustrate it? What do you have available to you? Do you have artworks that we can, that have been photographed? Do you have documents and photographs that can be scanned? Do you have access to the scanners that will give you the high resolution? We can provide you with all of that information and background. If you don't have a scanner, we know places that do and how to hire and get those really high quality images. We have a team of people who are graphic designers who can design these engaging graphic panels that I showed you from the uh, projects that were completed. Who are the fabricators out there? Who's making, you know, finding a place is gonna print on metal took a little research, but between the team of 11 curators who all work together and myself, we were able to find fabricators. And believe it, things came from literally all over the country because just some places are outside of Connecticut and we tried to keep things in Connecticut, but some places we needed to ship things in. Um, but I would say what the big benefit that everybody really um, stressed is having those people with the expert background to tap into, to ask those questions and know if they didn't have the answer, someone in our group had the information that we could share and impart to them. And how much they learned. You know, what we wanna be able to do is walk away from this project, give you templates from the designers for those exhibit panels, give you the links and the handouts to show how to keep rehousing your collections making them accessible, finding the right materials and where to order them from. We want to empower you to keep going with this work. And it's been exciting to see that some of them, the boards and the volunteers are energized and they're already applying to the next round of quick grants from Connecticut Humanities because they don't wanna lose energy. They wanna keep this excitement going forward and keep going. So a question from Samantha, did $3,000 cover all of the projects or did each museum have to dip into their own money to accomplish the project? Well, I have to tell you, Samantha, it really varied. Some sites did not spend their full 3,000. I can tell you like Slater Museum that definitely came in under budget, but the amount of writing and research, six panels was all that could really be accomplished with their staffing um, for this project. Someone over budget, Stanley Whitman is a place that decided, we told them we didn't think we could do the whole room. Andy wanted the whole room done. So they added some of their own funding to that project. Um, $3,000, I will say, depending on the project can be a tight squeeze, especially for exhibits, but you are gonna be working with curators who understand the cost of materials, and we'll work with you. We're not, you know, one thing we do not provide you with is we're not going to Staples and gluing things to foam core. These are going to be professional panels printed on Sintra that are offset from the wall. They look beautiful. They're durable. They're not going to warp. They're not going to change over time. So if you've had a long-term exhibit, you're not going to have long-term uh, exhibit panels and labeling to go with them. How do we do a budget if we don't know yet what materials might be needed? You actually don't submit a budget for this grant. 
you're just proposing the project. Once you start working with the curators, they'll start looking at the scope. Now, I'm going to tell you, you and I might talk about a project and because I don't have the time to be able to go out to all your sites. And we will try to hone in on what we think is the right scale of your project. Once the curators come out on site, they may, you know, what I think was maybe a 10 foot wall. And then they go out and say, well, that's a 30 foot wall we have to redo. We are going to be able to do half of that. So once they come out and they talk to you and they kind of finalize the scope of the project and they also determine what's going to be needed, you will work directly with the curators to create that budget. So it's during the actual grant process that, you know, you share your budgets with me to sign off on. And to just be clear, I want you to spend the $3,000. I don't want any money back. So if you're doing rehousing, but what you really need are room darkening window shades in addition to shelving and boxes, tell me, I will pay for that. If you're in a room where you really have concerns about the environment and want to put in a data logger, let's talk about that. Um, if you have broken exhibit cases and you need strong young men to haul them out for you, Believe it or not, I've actually paid for that because if that's what's going to help open up your exhibit gallery, improve the look of it, I will send, you know, they have those signs, you know, college hunks moving junk. I'll send you some college hunks and let's, let's get the broken stuff out of your exhibit gallery and open it up and make it look better. So I'm very open to discussing how to spend the money. The, my goal is always what's going to make the biggest impact. If you're going to tell me it's having printed number two pencils with your institution's name on it, I'm probably going to say no. <laughs> Unless they're for like Stanley Whitman and you're going to be taking those pencils away as you're leaving your comments and putting them on the wall. We talk about all of these within the scope of your project and the work to be done and how best to spend that money. We are going to get, we are true Yankees. We're going to get every bang from every buck for you um, and get you to the finish line. But the most important thing to remember, even if summers at your site are busy with camps and visitors, you still have to work on this project. This project has to end. October 1st, because that's when the money stops. And Connecticut Humanities is going to want to know how I spent the money. And I can't say, I haven't yet. You know, that's not going to fly. So no extensions. But honestly, honestly, you have plenty of time because these are small, manageable projects with big outcomes. In addition to signage, is there a consideration for spot video descriptions? Bob King, what do you mean by spot video descriptions? Like a, a, like a recorded video about an object or a section of the exhibit? Uh, yes, just a video that shows one particular item or group of items and um, a video that runs for whatever, 30 seconds, one minute, uh, something that stands alone. Uh, experience has shown me in exhibits that videos usually break the budget, but what you can do is that, you know, um, for example, let's say, um, you're talking about the Smith family and you incorporate a couple photographs on an exhibit panel or in a case, but maybe you have others that really are terrific. You can absolutely scan more and we can add that so that you can access it through a QR code that's in the display case, that's on the wall. So while it's not maybe a video description, it's still expanding the access to your resources for your visitor. So I would say the video would be something to definitely talk with the curators and whether or not there's space in the budget for something like that. Anything else?
I'm just looking at my list. I have, of course, hanging in the office, all the projects we've done. The one other project I will just mention, because this is also a little different, is at the New England Carousel Museum in Bristol. What they wanted to do was make their restoration studio they have of carousel horses part of the visitor experience. And so what we actually did is help buy glass doors instead of the solid doors. So you can now look into the restoration studio. Um, we designed a 10 foot wide banner, fabric banner that shows all the steps of carousel horse restoration, created title banners as well as directional signage. So people know, keep going down this hall. You're going to find more cool stuff and you're going to see the restoration studio if you go this this way. So those were things that they wanted to make it accessible. But during those conversations, that's where the curator said, well, let's let them know how to find this place and that what they're going to find. And then let's break out the stages because sometimes you're in there working, sometimes you're not, but you can't go in because it's actually a workshop with power tools. But now there are windows and doors where you can see and um but they decided to gussy it up. They painted the area. They uh, bought curtains to kind of cordon off more spa spaces. They got so energized that they actually, they are an example of where they went even further. All right. So, so there's a question from Barbara about, um, about some storage. I don't know if she wants to share a little bit more about that live um, with you. I don't know if you can see this question. We have a very small museum in Roxbury that was once the Hall of Records. We okay. have shelves in the vault that are very wobbly and need replacing. Is there a way that you know to disguise storage with display? I'm not sure I understand that question. So I don't know if um, Barbara, yeah, you want I'm to not, clarify. I'm not following you. Is the vault open to yes. visitors? Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Okay. Um, we are open. Oh we hadn't been open for years this year we managed two events and it, it's just a little square building with a vault in it and a little other space and things have been stacked on shelves inside the vault which is a handy place to store but we also have some clothing on mannequins and stuff so I didn't know if we could design some kind of shelving that had sort of like a divided the room and so that we would have sliding doors or some kind of written panels or something I mean I can imagine it I think well, it, since I haven't seen the space, it's really hard to know. Um, having visible display, if you just go Google visible museum storage, there's a lot of great solutions out there that have been done by different museums so that the more collections are visible to visitors when they come through. It sounds like the vault should probably stay the vault for storage that's not accessed by your visitors but then how to and then those only come out but that you know that would be where you may maybe store papers and photographs things that are housed for researchers and for you to use but and then create a more exhibit area whether in some spaces that's just the perimeter um if you have to use the rest of the room for meetings and programs so that's something to kind of think about look look online a little bit let's set up a time to talk Okay. If you can send me some photographs of it, then um, that would probably um, help also. Right. I have to take some photographs for the, for the so that works. <laughs> okay, cool. Um, yes, we did record today's session, and I'm going to post it on, um, like all colleague circles, it'll be on the CLHO YouTube channel, and it'll also be on the Museum Makeover page of Conservation Connections website. And... Did I miss any questions, Amherst, or did we get them? I don't think so. Okay, cool. Well, thank you so much, Kathy. It was incredibly informative, and it's always great to see the photos of the incredible projects. I have been fortunate enough to visit a, a couple of them so far, and I'm going to be out in Sharon next week. Um, so it's it's just been really exciting, all of the stuff that I've been hearing about, being able to see it come into reality. Um, and I really hope to see applications from everyone who's here. Um, we really, I think there are, there's a lot of work that, you know, we're really proud of this program. I think Connecticut Humanities is very excited about it as well. Um, and we think that this is really one of the most tangible and visible ways um, to really kind of show 
our legislators the impact of the incredible investment that they've made in Connecticut's cultural sector um, for this biennium. So um, we're really excited to showcase it, to talk it up. Um, and the more demand that we see for this program, the easier it will be to justify continued spending on this project. So um, even if you don't receive a grant, you've done work to help us justify the continuation of this program. So please don't hesitate to call Kathy and discuss your project and get an application in. It's easy to do and we really want to see we really want to see and fund your projects. Yes, thank you so much, Amos, and thank you, everybody. I'm so glad to see all these faces here, and I'm really looking forward to uh, setting up a time to chat with you about your projects. Thank you.